Hello and welcome to another edition of Calkine Sports. James Preston with you live from Sydney for Calkine TV. And in this episode, the NRL is facing a number of scandals surrounding COVID-19 and there's a new origin venue. Bulldogs player Brad Dietz will join me soon to unpack it all. England are singing Sweet Caroline as they head into the Euros 2020 final and Adam Santorossa joins me to talk about the beautiful game and it's week two of Wimbledon and Brett Phillips has every ace and double fault covered. But let's start with some major news from the Tokyo Olympics. The games are set to be held with no fans after Japan was plunged into a state of emergency due to a rise in the number of COVID-19 infections. The crucial decision was made at a meeting of organisers, including the International Olympics Committee and the International Paralympic Committee. Tokyo Olympic Minister Tamiyo Murakawa confirmed the disappointing news following the decision from the Japanese government to enact emergency measures from now until the end of August 22. The decision means that the Tokyo Olympics could become the first games in history to be held behind closed doors. Still with the Olympics and Australia have officially unveiled their history-making flag bearers. Four-time Olympian basketballer Paddy Mills becomes the first Indigenous flag bearer in the nation's history. And fellow four-time Olympian Kate Campbell is also making history, becoming the first female swimmer to be named as a flag bearer. It's also the first time since 1980 that dual flag bearers have been appointed. In 1980, Denise Robertson Boyd and Max Mexer led the way for the country, but like most Western nations that year, the duo held aloft the Olympic flag rather than Australia's in protest of host Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. The Olympics opening ceremony will begin on July 23. In the world of boxing, Tim Zhu has continued his march towards the world title after his battering of underdog Stevie Spark in Newcastle. Sue retained his WBO Global Super Welterweight title and added the Commonwealth belt to his collection with a comprehensive third round stoppage against his last minute opponent who was gallant but severely outclassed. In rugby union, Fiji is gearing up to play their first test match against heavyweights New Zealand since 2011. Fiji will be aiming for their first victory over the current number two side in the world, having lost all five of their previous fixtures. Time now to turn our attention to tennis and at Wimbledon we've arrived at the final for the women's draw and the semis for the men's. And for the complete lowdown I caught up a little earlier with tennis commentator Brett Phillips. Well Brett Phillips, welcome to Cowkind Sports. Thank you James, nice to chat. Yeah, great to have you back once again mate. Brett, we're at the pointy end of Wimbledon and Ash Barty, she's got one hand on the trophy. Can she add her second Grand Slam to the cabinet? Oh, there's no doubt. She's uh, timed this run beautifully, I think. Uh, she's got better and better each match. Uh, last night was terrific, particularly getting that first set against Angie Kerber, who was probably the, the toughest opposition uh, she'd faced and, you know, the credentials of being a, a Grand Slam champion at Wimbledon back in 2018. Been a bit of a resurgence in form for Kerber, but you always felt if uh, Ash could get it on her terms and get off to a great start. She was going to be tough to peg back. And yeah, that first set under a belt, 6-3, we expected a response from Kerber and uh, she mounted that. But then Ash uh, got things back on track and then played a brilliant tiebreaker and executed pretty much uh, how we expected her to. Her first serve percentage could uh, certainly increase. Uh, but when that first serve goes in, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty tough to return um the Ash serve and her forehand, I thought, was particularly good last night. She really attacked. I mean, Kerber was never going to blow her off the court. Uh, when Ash saw anything that was there for the kill, so to speak, uh, she went for it, played her shots, and now uh, she's a great chance. She's in terrific form. Carolina Pliskova will be her opponent who got past uh, Sabalenka. Uh, they've met seven times, these two. Ash has got the 5 2 head to head. Uh, no one served more aces in the tournament than Pliskova, so we know what she brings. She's big off the ground, big serve. Her movement hasn't always been elite, so that's where Ash can maybe exploit her, although it's got a bit better for Pliskova during this tournament, which you do require on the grass. Uh, but I think Ash can go into this final uh, full of confidence. It really comes down to execution, and it's on her record, I think. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, the fingers are definitely crossed, toes as well, but you can't see that on camera. So hopefully we get another big win for Ash Barty now. For many people on the men's side of the draw, a bit of a sad story. I know you and I are huge fans of Roger Federer, obviously falling in the fourth round. That now leaves a pretty clear path for Novak Djokovic. I mean, there's no Nadal, no Tsitsipas, Medvedev or Zverev. Surely, getting through the semifinal, he now equals the Grand Slam record. All right, James. There's a kid oh. called Dennis. 
Dennis Shapovalov. Now, I'm very bullish about this kid. He's grown in stature uh, this tournament. Now, he, I think, has convinced himself that he's ready for the big stage. He's been just on the cusp of the top 10. I think he's the most exciting of the young guys. Big lefty, huge ground strokes, single-handed backhand. He's got a bit of charisma about him. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's great with the media. He's got a bit of X factor. Now, he's beaten Murray, Bautista, Agut, and Hutchinov. Mm. It is a, a, a very emphatic 6 and 0 head to head Novak over Dennis, but the last three times they've met, it's getting closer, where he's got Novak to a 7 6, 7 5, 7 6 sets. So if Dennis plays the lights out, if he executes everything and he's got that X factor, as I mentioned, I think he could rattle the cage a little bit of Djokovic. I mean, Novak starts as the favourite, he deserves that. He's cruised through this tournament, and that brick wall of defence is going to be tough to penetrate. But if, uh, if Dennis executes, uh, I think we've got game on tonight. So uh, maybe it's my heart that uh, he's speaking a little bit. But I think Dennis has deserved this place in the semi final. He has played outstanding tennis. The other one, Herkash Berrettini. I think Berrettini uh, certainly will get uh, Hubie, who knocked out uh, Roger, of course, and beat Medvedev. So he deserves his place as well. But Berrettini's been in great form. One in Queens on the grass. It was great form on the clay. I think he's 31 and six, the win loss this year, Berrettini. So. He's flying, and I reckon we can get him into the final uh, in four sets. Okay. And and so that's probably where you think if anyone's going to be able to stop Novak, that's probably where it's coming from? I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Djokovic is just about invincible, but <laughs> Novak, can, Novak is human as well. And if you can build enough pressure, I mean, look what Tsitsipas was able to do in that French Open final, win the first two sets. I mean, Novak's got the great ability that even if he's two sets to love down, he can get off the canvas and he'll back his ability and he just resets and he goes and he brings his experience and everything else, whereas the other player can't quite get to the finish line. So there's a chance with Novak, but you've got to be absolutely spot on. You've got to, you've got to be prepared to go the journey with him because he'll stay out there and play three or four hours, no problems. He's an incredible athlete. So we'll see if Dennis has got the patience and just got the ability to sort of stay in the moment. Um, but I think it'll be um, a pretty good semi-final. Yeah, look, really looking forward to it, Brett. As always, thank you so much for your time, and fingers crossed that we can get a bit of a, a bit of Dennis magic to make sure that we can topple the crown of the Joker. <laughs> yes, we still love Novak, but hey, very I love a change of the guard, <laughs> and uh, tennis probably needs a little bit of that right now. So it could be a historic moment. We'll wait and see. Absolutely, Brett. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Calkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Calkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Calkine TV and join me. Well, thanks for tuning in. I'm James Preston and this is Calkine Sports live from Sydney and it's time now to take a look at the beautiful game with football commentator and journalist Adam Santarossa. Well, Adam Santarossa, thanks so much for joining Calkine Sports. Yeah, good to be here, James. Now, Matt, the, obviously uh, the two big stories in world football come from two of the globe's biggest tournaments. There's plenty of emotion in the air. I know you're chomping at the bit to talk about Italy, but let's start with the Copa America. Dramatic finish, Argentina through to the final after defeating Colombia with a lot of drama. Always drama in, in the Copa America, but uh, that sets up a great final. I mean, we've seen it time and time again in this competition, uh, Brazil and Argentina. Uh, I think Brazil have been my, my pick throughout the tournament. I think, uh, you know, currently ranked number two in the world mm. uh, and obviously Belgium number one, which, um, you know, this Copa America result should take Brazil to the top again of the world rankings. And uh, look, I, I think they'll be too good for Argentina. As you mentioned, the, the drama to get through, um, they haven't really hit their straps, I've felt, from what I've seen from them this tournament. Um, certainly got the potential. Everyone talks about Lionel Messi and, and his impact and, and the big stage. But um, this is something, I guess, Argentina 
really lack is a big tournament win. So Messi will be chomping for that, but I think Brazil will get it done in the final. Well, look, as part of the big tournament win and also part of Leo Messi, there's been a bit of discussion about whether him leading his country to victory in this competition would then certify him as the GOAT. For me, I don't think that's the case. Surely it'd have to be a World Cup or something that gives him that sort of bearing in, in world football. Yeah, look, I think uh, I'm, I'm in that camp as well. I agree. I think uh, that the whole Ronaldo versus Messi debate is the fact that, and, and I lean to Ronaldo in that, purely the fact that he's done it in multiple competitions. He's done it in Serie A, the Premier League and also La Liga. Um, and he's also done it, you know, he's won a Euro with Portugal. Um, I think Messi's done his best work with Argentina. He obviously nearly took them to to a World Cup um, in Brazil in, in 2014. But that's been the criticism of, of him. He hasn't dominated tournaments enough. I mean, he could he could put quite a strong argument up, though, with a performance against Brazil in the final. So we, we'll wait and see. But uh, it's always, if you want to get, if you want to polarise football fans, you just ask them that question. Whether oh, Messi or Ronaldo or, or who's the GOAT out of... Uh, out of Lionel Messi and and the rest. Well, then we always forget the uh, the great ones as well, Maradona, Pele. It's it's now just a conversation. It always appears to be between Ronaldo and Messi. And you know, a lot of people also want to chuck in now original Ronaldo too, back from the Real Madrid day. So, look, it's probably one that's not going to be sorted. I would imagine until a good sort of twenty years after they both retired. But Adam, let's move on to the big one. A very dramatic week of football at the Euro. Some awesome narratives that are appearing as well. But England and Italy in the big dance. We'll have a look at the final itself in just a moment, but there was so much drama in England's semi against Denmark. I want to talk about the penalty against Raheem Sterling. Now, that decision to me, surely not a penalty. Yeah, I agree. I, I was very surprised. I thought it was a, a soft penalty. And, and I mean, again, it brings the VAR into question. I mean, if you can use the VAR to give penalties in those instances, why can't you take them away if mm. there's no contact, you know? And I felt uh, I felt it was the decision that obviously favoured England and, you know, that fortune obviously continued when, when Harry Kane, not the greatest penalty he's taken in his career, Casper <laughs> Michael made a good save and then, and then Kane obviously puts in the rebound. So uh, I think, yeah, luck was clearly on England's side, but... They're those penalties. You see them given uh, in world football, but I think, as I said, with VAR now assisting, there wasn't a lot of contact you could really point to. So, look, if you can give a penalty when the referee on the field says no penalty, why can't you, you reverse that when he gives a penalty and you don't see any contact on the vision? Surely you can, surely you can take it away. So um, contentious, but I think in this instance, given the, how loud the English fans are, they're, they're, um, they're all saying penalty. So... Uh, not much is going to be done now. now. A lot of pressure on the referee at a packed Wembley, that's for sure. How much of that was sort of justice, I suppose, for the earlier decision that didn't go Harry Kane's way? That one, for me, actually was a penalty. Again, VAR, though, not stepping in there. Uh, I think the actual free kick, though, came for uh, Denmark in terms of simulation, which th- there was contact. Yeah, my understanding was that the there was a foul uh, in the build-up that, it, that he gave the free kick for. So that instantly negates anything that happens after that. So that's why they couldn't step in to the Kane penalty. That was obviously a, a clear penalty if the if the play had proceeded. But uh, it was a bit of a grey area. My understanding was that it, the play had stopped in the referee's eyes, so he then couldn't judge that decision. And then obviously the VAR uh, can't step in. So a bit of a technical one, but uh, a bit of justice perhaps. Football's got a way of uh, dealing out its justice in, in, that, in that way. But, uh, yeah, England, uh, it would have been... It would have been so cruel given how dominant they were that, you know, not only did they they get a penalty, then miss the penalty, it, uh, it would have been cruel for them. So I think the right result in the end and, and deserve it to be in the final. Yeah, still a good run, though, for Denmark against the odds, realistically, too. Let's now have a look at the final itself. Now, I'm going to let you have your little glorious gloating moment. There comes the smile already. Italy are through, mate. You must be very excited about that. And realistically, a final probably, I would say, most people were looking forward to. Coming up against England, there's so many wonderful stories that are going to be formed over the next few days. Yeah, obviously I have an invested interest uh, being an Italian background, but um, yeah, I think as a football fan, this is the final everyone wanted. You know, even if you're a neutral, you you really want two heavyweights to meet in the final, and we would have got that regardless of Spain or Italy going through. But now we have England and Italy, uh, something a matchup we don't often see 
in major tournaments. I know they played in the World Cup in the first round uh, in Brazil in 2014, but before then, uh, you've got to go all the way back to the 1990 uh, World Cup semi final. So, quite a time in terms of big stakes and, and big occasions. And, and this will be this will be a massive game and and worthy of a European final. Obviously, England on, on their home turf and Italy. Uh, on a magical run where, you know, a lot of people not really fancying them coming in. They didn't make the last World Cup, but, you know, Roberto Mancini has invested in a new generation and uh, they're certainly delivering, as are England and Gareth Southgate. It's real new eras for both uh, young players really uh, at the forefront. And, uh, yeah, Monday's final is going to be certainly something spectacular, I think. I just hope finals are often cagey and, and, and dull affairs. I hope they both come out and play some football and, and we see a terrific game. Yeah, of course, England's first final since 1966. It's been a long wait. They have to wait a few more days before they can start seeing finally it's coming home. Adam, just before I let you go, who wins the final? Uh, I'm trying not to be biased, but uh, look, I think I think I'm going to go with Italy purely on the fact that I know it's at Wembley. I know England uh, have that whole country behind them, obviously on home soil, but that comes with a lot of pressure and expectation, and we saw them. Um, struggle with that a little bit uh, against Denmark in the semi-final. Italy, you know, we're celebrating that they're in the final already. Uh, I just think they're on that stage. They're they're more comfortable, and I think they'll 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 get it. May not be in ninety minutes, but I think they'll they'll lift the trophy home. All right, going down to the wire. That is the official word from Adam Santarossa. And Adam, thank you so much once again for joining the show. No problem at all. Yes, well, you can catch the Euro final from 5 a.m. on Monday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. And after the break, all the biggest NRL headlines from the week that's been with NRL player Brad Dietz on Kalkine Sports. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Thanks for tuning in to Calkine TV. I'm James Preston and you're watching Calkine Sports. It's been a dramatic week in the NRL once again and the best way to get the inside word is from a current NRL player. And a little earlier, I caught up with Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs hooker, Brad Dietz. Dietz, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me again. Mate, great to chat with you once again. There's some huge stories in rugby league this week, and we'll get to the Dragons struggling to fill the first grade squad in the coming weeks and also a big announcement surrounding Origin. But let's start with yourself, though. How's the hamstring coming along? How long until we can see you back on the ground? Yeah, it's coming along. Um... It's obviously one of those injuries where you gotta you gotta really take your time. A lot of a lot of people have told me who have done hamstrings before. Once you you think it's ready, probably give it another week or so. So I think um, another two weeks, and hopefully I'll be back out there. And look, in the meantime, no racing at Manly Course, so we know that doesn't go too well for hamstrings. No, that's it. No, no, no races for me. I'm not as fast as Turbo anyway. <laughs> now let's move on to the biggest story of the week, and that is the Dragons. Now. Look, on a personal level, I think the hardline stance from governments in relation to lockdowns is, you know, realistically a point of contention. But for the Dragons and all NRL players, it's essentially an employment contract with the NRL with the conditions. I mean, you and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about life in the bubble. All the players seem to understand the concept of if you step outside of the allowances and the guidelines that the NRL hands down, then there are consequences. So what do you make of the penalties? And obviously the big one, Paul Vaughan having his contract torn up. Yeah, obviously it was a massive decision from from the Dragons and and the NRL in conjunction. I think um, as much as you don't want to see it, I think I think they said that he's had a couple of strikes against him over the last couple of years. And I mean, he, he knew the risks he was taking. I know I know there'd be a lot of guys in the bubble right now that wish they could have people over and just socialise, um, just like life was normal. But mm. unfortunately, if we want to keep the competition going and um, and they're being footy on TV and state of origin games, then we just have to follow what the, the NRL and the, the government have come up with to keep us on the field. Well, we were talking about Jeremy Marshall King just a moment ago. Now, his brother Benji the other night went on TV and he was quite scathing in his review of Paul Vaughan particularly and, and saying, look, you know, as, as you've sort of mentioned there, 
this is a product we've already taken pay cuts last season. We've got to stick to these guidelines. Is is that sort of where you're sitting as well? You you think we we need to stay down this straight and narrow path in order to keep the game's momentum continuing? I think so. I think if we if we just go out and then all it takes is one person to to contract COVID in a team, and then mm. who knows what the ramifications of that would be. Um, but yeah, I think like I said, if we can just, it's only going to be for a short period of time, hopefully, and um, the better we can do our job of staying at home and just get it, keeping the game going, then the quicker we'll be out of it. Yeah, well said. Now let's move on from our contential stuff with the Dragons itself to another point of contention, which is some of the blowout scores we've been seeing throughout, I suppose, the last 18 months, really, pretty much since the uh, the six again rule came in from Peter Volandis. Saturday itself was, you know, not a great day for many sides. Unfortunately, your dogs went down 66-0 to, to Manly, 44-6, to the Titans over the Raiders, 38-0, Knights over Cowboys, and then obviously uh, to start the week, the Storm thrashing the Roosters, 46-0. What do you make of it? As a player, do you think it's down to the six again rule or is there an argument to do with cap management? Which one do you think is more prominent? I don't know. I think, uh, I think the six again rule has got somewhat to do with it, but... Um... I don't think you could say it's all up to all up to that rule because teams haven't had enough time to uh, to adjust to that. And I think we're seeing a few less six again calls um, compared to right at the start of the year, where it was pretty much like every second, third set you'd see six to go for one team. Um, and teams are finding a way around um, having six agains called against them. Like teams are giving away six to go on the first tackle when they're so far away from their line, it's not going to make a difference to them. So. I don't think you could say it's definitely down to the six again. Um, whether the salary cap has anything to do with it, I'm not sure. It's just the salary cap's been in there for years now and we never really have had this kind of, uh, these blowout schools. So it's, it's a tricky one. I don't, I'm not too sure what you could put it down to. Is there somewhat of an intersection then, I guess, of, you know, teams have already set up the players that are on their roster and a lot of those players, you know, signed to multi-year deals and then all of a sudden we have these huge rule changes coming in and, you know, take you back a few years, Sam Cassiano, I mean, 125, 130 kilogram prop, he's going to be experiencing extreme fatigue. There are still players like that floating around. You guys got a couple of big boppers. Do you think that comes into it too, the six again mixed in with the existing rosters? Yeah, I think you think you've got a point there. I mean, the rules that have come in came in pretty quick and um, there wasn't a lot of time to for teams to adjust to, to, their, to the rules and for players to get their their body shapes in order to cope with the new demands. But, yeah, I think there's definitely somewhat to do with it. I think we've been on the wrong end of some six agains this year and we've mm. ultimately lost those games. Um, so, yeah, I think that that could be partially some of it. It's, I think it's too hard to put the blame on uh, on one aspect of it, whether it's the salary cap or um, all the rule changes. Well, with the six agains, when you're on the field yourself, do you have any time whatsoever to sort of contemplate why it's been ruled six again, any time to question it, or is it just so much fatigue you're, you're constantly sort of scrambling and retreating? Yeah, I think on the field it's just kind of you, you hear the six again and you you kind of just trying to worry about what's going to happen next. Um, I think a lot of the time I just assume something, there's something being in the ruck, like a hand on the ball trying to slow it down or something like that and um, yeah, I don't. You don't really have too much time to dwell on it. Like you said, the the play is still going, and um, more often than not, it's a quick play to ball. And we've tried to tried to slow it down, so they've got the six again. So we're just trying to shut that next play down. Well, just before we move on to Origin, how are you doing in terms of training and preparation? Maybe through the video work. Is there any particular ways the Bulldogs are are looking at the six again rules and the other new rules that have come in to try and, I suppose, redirect the way that you play the game? Uh, not really. I think we're just trying to be really squeaky clean um, with in defence and trying not to give any um, six again rulings against us, especially later on in the tackle counts. Um, early on, I think while we would prefer not to give away another tackle or two, um, it's not too much of a, a problem for us. Um, but with the ball, I think we're, we've we've actually struggled this year trying to get six agains go our way. So I think we've really focused on ways that we can. We can kind of uh, generate a few more of them, whether it's um, a quick play to ball or a little little bit of ad lib footy, and um, have teams re- really trying to slow us down any way they can and get a few more six against. 
Yeah, well, I don't think it's one that we're really going to find an answer to for this week. Is it? It's still going to be a, an ongoing issue to unfold and try and get those score lines back down to some sort of palatable margin, I suppose. Last one before I let you go, Brad. State of Origin 3. The Blues have already wrapped up the series. There's plenty of outs for both sides, a couple of returning as well, Caelan Ponga, for example. Uh, but the big story here is that the game is supposedly heading to Newcastle. Do you reckon the NRL got it right on that call? Yeah, I think they've they've got their hands tied. Really, like I don't think we're going to see any uh, capacity crowds at ANZ or anything. But I'm sure um, all the locals up in the Hunter will be will be killing for some some rep footy, especially State of Origin. Um, mm-hmm. They've always they've always they're really into their footy up there, and um, I don't think they've had many rep games. I think they've had a couple of tests there, but State of Origin, we all know it's it's a different beast, and everyone wants to to be there and be a part of it. Um, well, on the game itself, I think I think New South Wales could be in for a clean sweep. I know they've got um, Cleary and Luai out, but um, I think they've just got too many class players across the park that will that will want to get the job done. And um, I think they're still filthy on on the result last year, so I think they'll they'll be out to prove a point and uh, really wipe the wipe the floor with Queensland. Mate, I know you bleed for the Blues, that's for sure. Last one before I let you go, Mitchell Moses, the selection at halfback. Uh, a lot of talk about potentially Adam Reynolds and Cody Walker being the halves combination. How do you think this one's going to play out with Freddie opting for Moses and Whiten? Uh, it'll be interesting. I think uh, obviously Whiten's been there and done that, same as same as the Souths halves. Um, but I think it's it's one of those situations where I guess if you're not going to pick both of them, maybe you could just go with someone else like Mitch Moses. I mean, he's been in some good form this year and. Um, and obviously Brad Arthur's come out and backed him that if he's not going to get picked now, he's never going to get picked. So a um, little bit less pressure on him because it's the, get the series is over. So hopefully he can stand up and, uh, and do a job. Yeah, well, beautiful. I'll be cheering for them. I know you will as well. Brad, once again, thanks so much for your time, mate. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, best of luck to Mitch Moses and also Jack White in the halves and the Blues looking to complete a clean sweep next Wednesday in Newcastle. Stay with us on Kalkine TV. After the break, we wrap up the show with the business side of sports. This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Kalkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Kalkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Kalkine TV and join me. Welcome back to Cowkine Sports. Great to have your company live from our studios in Sydney. And as they often say, sport is now big business. And on Cowkine Sports, it's now time to take a look at the finances off the field. Let's start with crypto players, Crypto.com, who are making a slew of sports marketing partnerships. Crypto.com, the digital asset exchange organisation, has continued making aggressive marketing inroads in the sports world over the past few weeks. Last week, the online crypto platform became the global partner of the F1, ahead of the new Sprint Series for 2021. That's in addition to having previously partnered with NHL team the Montreal Canadiens, the Italian Serie A Football League and the Aston Martin F1 team. On July 7, Crypto.com announced a further long-term partnership with the Ultimate Fighting Championship, commonly known as the UFC. The deal will see all athlete kits and the kits of their fight corner donning the Crypto.com brand. On the back of the announcement, Crypto.com rallied against a previous day loss of 5.3% to take their weekly loss gain percentage to a significant overall improvement of minus 0.84%. Likewise, UFC's parent company Endeavor Group experienced some recovery after a poor five-day run, with the release coinciding with a 2.66% increase to hit $26.21, US up from $25.35 US on July 6. For the beautiful game, Belgian fans hoping to tune into the heroics of countryman Kevin De Bruyne for Manchester City will once again be doing so via Telenet. The broadcaster, who already has the rights to screen matches in Belgium for the upcoming 21-22 season, has now extended their rights for coverage for a further three seasons up until the 24-25 season. 
And finally, the NFL and social media giant Twitter have announced a multi-year partnership extension which includes a commitment to producing 20 exclusive content features on live audio feature Twitter spaces during the 21 season. Notably, the NFL is the first sports league to partner with Twitter to offer sponsored Twitter spaces. The NFL's Twitter spaces will include participation from current NFL players and other NFL talent to discuss season matchups and insights. They'll be available throughout the season as well as in conjunction with NFL tentpole events, including kickoff, Super Bowl, and the NFL draft. And the deal was announced on July 8. Following the afternoon announcement, Twitter's share price recovered slightly from a poor morning, improving from $66.64 up to $67.30. All right, well, that's all the time we've got for sports business, and that's it for this edition of Calkine Sports. We'll have another edition for you next week. I'm James Preston for Calkine TV.